Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. Today I'm going to be going over chapter 8 and chapter 9 of the R for Data Science book by Hadley Week with them, Nina Sedinkaya Rendell and Garrett Bowman. So chapter 8 is on data and in, data import and then chapter 9 is going to be on um, what's low getting help. So starting off with data import, so like our learning objectives are to read data from this using the read R function um, or family of functions and compare and contrast the various read R um, read functions with base R equivalents and to parse character data into other data types, um, diagnose the problems that may arise and then write data to this using um, the read R write family of functions. Okay, so as far as reading data from a file, the most common rectangular data file type is CSV, which is short for comma separated values. And the first row, commonly called the header row, gives the column names and the rows, the additional rows provide the data. And the columns are separated or delimited, delimited by commas. And we can read CSV files into R using the reader read underscore CSV function. So read underscore CSV. So the first argument is the most important and it's the path or address to the file. Um, in this example, we're using the file students.csv and it lives in the data folder. Um, so here you see where students, um, we're assigning it to read underscore CSV. Um, from the folder data and the students.csv file. And then when we when we run the read underscore csv function, it prints off a message telling us the number of rows and columns of the data, the delimiter that was used in the column specifications, or names of columns organized by type of data the columns contain. So yeah, so prints out tells us the number of rows and columns. So here we have six rows and five columns. The delimiter, the delimiter that was used, so here it's the comma, and then the column specifications where we have four character, um, character variables with their full name, favorite food, meal plan, and age, and then one double or like number, um, a number column or variable, which is student ID. Um, let me see if it's actually cool. And I guess I've never actually paid attention to that, but I guess we can use the spec function to achieve full column specification for the data. Um, um, we can put in show column types equal false to quiet this message in the future. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> okay, so then transforming data from a file. So once you read data in, the first step usually involves transforming it in some way to make it easier to work with in the rest of your analysis. And this includes addressing issues such as mislabeled NA values, um, non-syntactic column names, and mislabeled variable types. So here we're looking at our, our data set student, and it's a six by five table. Um, so our six, six columns, student ID, full name, um favorite sorry our five columns <laughs> student id full name favorite food meal plan and age and then we have six observations for those so first kind of looking at the, the mislabeled na values so for example in the favorite favorite dot food column there are a bunch of food items and then the character string na which should have been a real NA that R will rec recognize is not available. So yeah, so I should probably show you the data. Oh, I did not run this. Oh, it's literally only that length. Okay. <laughs> um, 
but yeah so we have an n slash a which isn't the real n a that we want so actually i think it already fixed it ah it already fixed it it's not supposed to look like that i think i wrote it already huh Okay, yeah, so in the actual console, it shows you what it would look like originally, where it's it has the NA that looks like that with the dash version it being an NA. I think that would be what R looks for. Okay, and then, oh, that's fine. <laughs> and then by default, the read CSV only recognizes empty strings in the data set um, as NAs, but we want to recognize the character string n slash a, and we address this using the na argument. Okay, that's why I was doing that. Okay, so this is after, so this was the original data. So you see where it has like the n slash a there, but we want it to give us those. So to do that, um, to do that, we do the read underscore CSV. Um, and then we mentioned the actual file, the path to the file, and put na is equal to concatenate um, n slash a, and then put it blank, like the blank. I forgot exactly what it says the, um, the argument are. Well, yeah, so the argument we're asking for na, we're telling it that these, we want them to be changed to this, and by like the empty string. And then by doing that, we'll get these NAs that um, R recognizes. And then also, if you have any questions, just let me know or comment. <laughs> All right, so then there's non-syntactic column names. And that would be, um, so for example, looking at the student data frame again, so you have the column student ID and full name columns that are surrounded by the back ticks, which are, oh, that doesn't look good. It didn't show probably at all. Um, but the back ticks, basically that, that thing right there is a back tick. Um, and it's because it contains spaces, which mean, meaning it's non-syntactic and it breaks R as usual rules for variable names. Oh yeah, Ken said he didn't um, realize you could change what it, it should recognize as NA. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. So much things I'm learning from like reading this book. Very useful, definitely. And then, yeah, to refer to these variables, you need to surround them with the back ticks. So yeah, again, you can even just look at the one right before this, where you see the variables, student ID and full name have the back ticks. And then, so what we do to transform the data, so we take that data frame and type it into, and um, type it and rename student, um, the student ID or student space ID to be student underscore ID, and then full name to be full underscore name. And then we see the table now with, rather than it being the student space ID or full name, we have the student underscore ID and full name. And it also carried over our results from before with the NAs. Okay, so next, oh, I guess also for that, regarding the non-syntactic column names, you could use the janitor package and it uses some heuristics to turn all of the, um, all the non-syntactic columns into snake case at, all at once. So yeah, you type the student data frame into the clean names function of janitor. And it did that same thing that we did with the other using the rename function. Okay, and then we also have mislabeled variable, variable types. So here we're gonna look at the column meal plan and it is supposed to be, a, it's originally it's labeled as a categorical value, oh, variable, or rather it is a categorical value variable 
with a known set of possible values and an R that's represented as a function. So using the factor function, um, the values in, meal plan, in the meal plan variable um, have stayed the same, but the type of variable denoted underneath the variable name has changed from character to factor. So yeah, so see meal plan here, where you see it's now factor rather than character. Um, yeah, so that was after we, so to do that, it was, we take again that code we did where we use the janitor function clean names to put this, put student ID and full name in snake face. And then we mutated meal plan to be a factor or made the new variable meal plan as a factor of the variable meal plan that we already had, basically. And then in a continuation regarding like mislabeled variables. So also age is a character variable. Um, it's listed here as a character variable because one of the observations is typed out as five instead of a numeric five. And obviously we want it to be a number rather than a character. So using the code below, we can use the if else function um, to say that if age, which is our test, is a string character five. So if if age, yes, is five, make it um, the word five, make it the number five. And if not, we leave it as the current age. So adding to that code we already had, we take the student data frame, type it into the plain names function, mutate um, meal plan as a factor, and then age, we're gonna parse the number using that kind of if else test. So if the age is yes is equal to five, um, then we want it to be the number five and based or or else will be the age that's already stated. And then we get these results. So kind of going through everything we have done, we see we've from previously we changed these to snake case. So they no longer have like the back ticks in the name. And meal plan, we changed it to be a factor rather than a character. And then age, now that we've um, used the if else to um, change one of the character strings, five, to make it a number five, it's now a double or like a number variable. Okay, so then other arguments, I have to clock for a second. So other arguments, um, we can demonstrate a couple other important arguments by using read underscore CSV to read um, strings formatted like a CSV file. So here we're um, reading in a CSV where, let me see. yeah. So here we're kind of building our own CSV where the header column, ABC, and then we have kind of these rows here. So yeah, two rows, two rows, and then three columns. The delimiter is the comma, and then we have three, three um double columns or number columns, and uh, let's see. So yeah, and it gives us a table, a two by three table, two, two rows, three columns. And then, let's see. And then some arguments we can demonstrate are also um, comment is equal to pound, skip is equal to end or false, or columns underscore names equal to false. So the first one, skip is equal to end. We can use it to skip the first n lines of metadata to be included at the top of the file. So say we're doing this, where it's read CSV and the first lines of metadata, there's the first line of metadata then the second line of metadata. And then we have like, yeah, we have our two other rows where we have, this would be like our header row. And that's our one row of, um, our one row of observations. And then, so we're skipping, skip equals two, where we're skipping these two. 
And then, so yeah, we're left with a double. Or, oh, three doubles. So that's three columns, X, Y, and Z. And you see that the X column, Y column, and Z column. Okay, and then comment is equal to pound. Um, you can use the comment, you can use comment equal to pound to drop all lines that start with, for example, the pound. So where we have read CSV and we have something like that, and then comment is equal to pound. So you see in the end, it doesn't read that, it doesn't read that line in as data because we've told it it's a comment. And yeah, so you see kind of, you don't see that it's being read in. Like here, when you look at the table. Okay, and then whole underscore names is equal to false. So in the case where the data does not have column names, you can use whole underscore names is equal to false to tell read underscore CSV not to treat the first row as headings and instead label them sequentially from X1 to Xn. So yeah, so here we have that, that again, using the read CSV function, the first row where it's one, two, three, second row where it's four, five, six, and call underscore names is equal to false. So yeah, so then again, where it's kind of telling us the specifications. And as far as our columns, we have three double columns, which are labeled X1, X2, and X3. And then when you look at it, it looks like this versus, for example, versus this, where it was, we called them X, Y, and Z this way, because we did call underscore names equal to false. R gave us the labels X1, X2, and X3. Okay, so also we can use column names as a character vector, character vector, um, and which will be used to make the call column names. So here, um, I guess it's basically instead of what we did before, where we said a call names is equal to false and it just gave us the different names. This one, we're telling it what we want as the names. So yeah, so we have our rows of, our, our rows of observations, and then we're giving the columns for those observations names. So again, we have our, our um, data frame that has three columns with the double doubles X, Y, and Z. And then you see that we have our three columns, X, Y, and Z with two rows of observations. Okay, so then there are other types of files that the reader package um, can read in with its various functions. So there's like read underscore CSV2 for semicolon separated files. So these files use the semicolon instead of the comma separate fields in our common in countries that use the comma as the decimal marker, like rather than like a period. And then read underscore TSV for tab delimit delimited files or read underscore delim, which reads in files with any delim delimiter. And it attempts to automatically guess the delimiter if you don't specify it. And then read underscore FWF for fixed width files. And you can specify fields by their widths with FWF underscore widths or by their positions with FWF underscore positions. And there's also read underscore table for a common variation of fixed width files where columns are separated by white space and read underscore log for Apache style log files. Okay, so controlling column types. Um, what is a fixed with file? A fixed with file. So I am not really familiar with it, but I'm assuming it's like where you have like tab delimited is like however I think a tab is like let me see. I believe a tab is like five spaces. So I'm assuming the fixed with file just means like any number of spaces, but I put a thing so we could, <laughs> let me see what it is. So you could see the other screen, right? 
So it's like the fix with file can be very compact representation of the most data. Um, I just throw this in. Let me, I'll put this in the chat. Hopefully it's able to answer your question. I didn't look it up, but my assumption is it's the space between the observations is all same. It's fixed at a certain number. I'm assuming I could be completely wrong. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so I think I said read underscore table. Um, a common variation of fixed with files where columns are separated by white space and read underscore log for Apache style log files. So controlling for column types. Um, a CSV file doesn't contain any information about the type of variables, such as whether it's a logical number or string. So reader will try to guess the type and it uses a heuristic to figure out the column types. So for each column, it pulls values of 1000, 1000 to the second power rows, spaced evenly from the first row to the last, ignoring missing values. And it then works through the following questions. Like, does it contain, like, true, is it logical? Like, does it contain true or false or F, F or T? Basically, it doesn't really matter what the case is, lower or uppercase. Um, but if so, it's logical. Or does it contain only numbers, such as a number one, or negative 4.5, or five to the sixth power, or infinity? If so, it's a number. And does it match the ISO 8601 standard? If so, it's a date or date time. And otherwise, it must be a string. But so this first thing works well if you have clean data, but not really in real life. But yeah, so here they did, um, they read in the CSV of like data they kind of made themselves. Um, and you see these are like our column headers and then our rows, three rows of observations. So if we again look at the information it tells us about the column specification, our delimiter is the, the comma, and we have one character variable, um, the name of which is string. We have one double, which is the numeric column. We have one logical, which is the logical column, and one date, <laughs> which is the date column. Um, and yeah, so you see it here in our table where our column names, logical, numeric, double, and string. And it did, it did parse, or I don't know if parse is the right word. It did label the columns correctly where the true, false, true, they're log logical. And like you see here, it's like the first, the first row of observation for the true, it says it's uppercase true. And then for the second observation, it's lowercase false but it changed, our table changed it to uppercase false. And then for our third row of observations, we have just the uppercase T, but it's still, our table still changed it to true. <clears throat> and then, yeah, so we have our numeric column again with the number one, 4.5 or infinity. And then we have our dates, our date column, and then our column of strings, which is just a bunch of letters. <laughs> um, so then, Let's talk about unexpected values. So the most common way column detection fails is that a column contains unexpected values and you get a character column instead of a more specific type. So one of the most common causes for this is a missing value recorded using something other than NA, the NA that reader expects. And in this, so right here, we're making a very small case below. And as you can see, like, our missing value is denoted by like the period. Um, but what happens if we have thousands of rows with only a few missing values represented with that period sprinkled among them? So here, yeah. So we're creating our simple underscore CSV data frame or vector, I suppose. And it's one column labeled X and then our values are 10, the period which is missing 20 and 30. So yeah, so we have again, four rows, one columns, as far as specifications, delimited by a, by a comma, and it's a character. 
and it's labeled as a character while well, obviously those should be number numbers but it labeled it as a character because I didn't know to read that as a missing value. <clears throat> now I want to purchase to tell reader that x is a numeric column and then see where it fills and you can do this with the whole underscore types argument which takes a named list where the names match the column names in the CSV file. So for our data frame, we're read, reading in the CSV, which is our simple CSV from before, that file, that um, frame we, data frame we created earlier, or I guess it would be a vector. <coughs> and then we're saying call underscore types is equal to a list where X is equal to call double. So we're saying the column should be a double um, instead of like a very uh, character. And then we get this warning and it tells us one or more parsing issues. And if we call problems, the function problems on our data frame, we can get some details. <clears throat> so yeah, so read underscore CSV reports their problem and tells us to use that function. And then when we use the function problems on our data frame, it tells us that, let me see. I feel like I should have written this. So I think it tells us in row three, in row three, column one, it was expecting a double. So it was expecting a number because that's what we're telling it is. And instead it got the period. And I'm not fully sure what that part is, but yeah. So yeah, so row three, column one, it wanted a double, but we gave it one of these. So yeah, when you look at here. It's like, yeah, and here it's column two, but I guess it's not realizing that this should be our header in that one. Or row two, sorry. And then, so problem tells us, well, the problem is in row three, column one, where reader expected a double but got a period. And that suggests the this data set uses the period for missing values. So then we set NA is equal to um, in quotes period and the automatic guessing succeeds giving us the numeric column that we want. So yeah, so again, here we have read underscore CSV. Um, we're reading our simple CSV and telling it that periods are NA values. And then here we get that we have four rows of one column, and uh, our column called x is a double, meaning it's a number, versus it being a character, like we saw in this one, where it shows it's a character, versus it being the double or a number, rather. Okay, so column types. So reader provides a total of nine column types for us to use. There's whole underscore logical and whole underscore double, which reads logical and real numbers, but reader will usually guess these for you. And there's whole underscore integer, which reads integers. And reading integers explicitly can occasionally be useful because they occupy half the memory of doubles. And then, so I guess if you have like a really, really big data set, it's, instead of saying it's a double, um, yeah, say it's an integer instead and save memory. <laughs> and then there's call underscore character, which reads strings, which can be useful to specify explicitly when you have a column that is a numeric identifier, such as um, um, that are like examples are a long series of digits that identify an object, but doesn't make sense to do mathematical operations to, such as phone numbers, social security numbers, or credit card numbers like their numbers, but you wouldn't add or subtract them, multiply or divide them. So you'd want to set them as characters instead. Um, and also there's col underscore factor, col underscore date, and col underscore date time, which creates factors, dates, and date times respectively. And we'll learn more about these data types in chapter 17 and 18. And there's also col underscore number, which is a permissive number numeric parser that will ignore non-numeric characters and is particularly useful for currencies. I've never heard of that one or doing that. So that sounds interesting. And we'll learn about it in chapter 14. And then there's col underscore skip, 
that skip the columns so it's not included in the results, which can be useful for speeding up reading the data if you have a large CSV file and you only want to use some of the columns. So then overriding default, um, default columns, it's also possible to override the default column by switching from list to polls and specifying that default or to only to, or to read in only the columns you specify using calls underscore only. So here we're creating another CSV, <laughs> um, named another CSV. And then when we rate, we use read underscore CSV for the another CSV and call types is equal to calls by default, call is equal to character. Let's see, call is equal to character. So yeah, we have a tibble, a one by three tibble with our our three columns and our one row of data as like listed in this um our CSV that we created. And then also like showing you calls equals only. So we're read underscore CSV, another underscore CSV, call types is equal to calls only, X is equal to call underscore character. And that one, before I didn't understand what it was, because I, for some reason, I thought polls only X was something else, but it's literally telling us we only want the column X and not the Y and Z. Yeah, when I was reading this before, I didn't understand it, but yeah, it's, we only want the column X, and then we're also telling it column X is a character. Yeah. Okay, so then there's reading data from multiple files. And in the case where your data is split across multiple files, instead of being contained in a single file, read underscore CSV can read these data in at once and stack them on top of each other in a single data. And as seen below, the ID argument adds a new column called file um, to the resulting data frame that identifies the file the data come from which is especially helpful in circumstances where the files you're reading in do not have an identifying column that can help you trace the observations back to the original source. So this one, there's three um, CSVs that's in the data folder. So it's 01 slash sales.csv and then the 02 and 03. So we're reading, we're creating this, um, we're creating this, um, I guess data frame or object and called sales underscore files. And we're reading the CSV. Well, I guess it would just be an object. Um, and then we're doing read underscore CSV to that object sales underscore files and using creating that new um, creating that new ID or yeah, using sorry, creating the new column or variable file, which is the ID telling you which which CSV is coming from. So yeah, so we have 19 rows and six columns where we have one, one column that's a character vector month, and then four columns that are doubles or numbers, which are year brand item and N. And then, yeah. So you see where we have this new, this new kind of column file, which tells you which CSV it's coming from. Um, and then, yeah, so basically it kind of just stacked them one on top of each other. You have the first file, the second file, the third file. And then reading data from multiple files continued. If you have many files you want to read in and you can use the base R list.files function to find the files for you by matching a pattern in the file's name. So this one, sales file, and it's list.files. And I guess if it has, it's from the data folder. Let me see. Pattern is equal to sales. I'm assuming that is saying, let me see. I'm not fully sure how to explain this or think of that fully, but I guess basically 
it's going to be a file that I suppose has the word data or is in the data folder. And then it has like the words sales in it and it's a .csv. And then it tells you what the names of those files are. And it gives us back those three, those same three files. So data, within the data folder, there's the 0 0.1 sales, 0 0.02 sales, and 0 0.3 sales TSV. Okay, so then there's writing to a file. So Reader also comes with two useful functions for writing back to this, which are write underscore CSV and write underscore TSV. And the most important arguments to these functions are X, the data frames to save and file, the location to save it. And you can also specify how missing values are written with any, and if you want to append an existing file. And note that the variable type information that you set up is lost when you save the CSV because you're starting over reading from a plain text file again. So we have students here, that table we saw before, or technically the one we created because it has all those changes we made um, with changing from the non syntactic names, updating the NA values and changing the plan to a vector. And so now we're gonna write CSV using that, that table. And we're gonna call it students slash two or dash two dot CSV. And then when we read it, we get um, six rows and five columns. The delimiter is again, the comma. And then we have three character, three character variables and two doubles instead of here where we had one double or two doubles, two characters, and a factor. So yeah. And then also I guess, yeah. Okay, so then there's RDS files. So write RDS and read RDS are uniform wrappers around the base functions read RDS and um, save RDS. So I guess, the write and read ones are from the read R function, basically. And the wrappers for the base R functions, read RDS and save RDS. Now, these store data in R's custom binary format called RDS, which means that when you reload the object, you're loading the same exact R object that you stored. So we're writing, so we're writing the new RDS from based on that other table we have. And then when we read it in, it still has all those changes we made where we had changed like the format of the column names, the NAs, and we changed no plan to factor. Okay, so then there's also the arrow, arrow package, which allows you to read and write parquet files, which are a fast binary file format that can be shared across programming languages. And parquet tends to be much faster than RDS and is usable outside of R, but it does require the arrow package. So you can call install the arrow package, then call the library, and then you could write underscore parquet students and save it as like a parquet file, and then you can also read it. And it still has all that same formatting we did, again, with the names, so the factor and the missing value. And then data entry. There are two useful functions to help you assemble a table by hand, um, doing a little data entry in your R script. And these are tibble, the tibble function, and the triple function, which is short for transpose tibble. And they differ in whether you lay out the tibble by columns or by rows, where tibble works by column and triple lets you lay out your data row by row. So here you see the tibble where, so this is one column, the X column, where the observations are one, two, five. You have the Y column, where the observations are H, M, G, and you have the Z column, where those are the observations. And you see it here, a triple, a three by three triple, where the triple, um, you're just, you're doing it row by row. So, yeah, so instead where we're, saying what's within each column. Here we're saying 
the first row, um, the first row, which ends up being our header, is X, um, has an X, a Y, and a Z. I forgot to put it there, but I think they said you have to use that to say what is a header. And then our next row, our, our next row, which is our first row of observations, we'll go 1H and 0 0.08 and so on with the second and third row of observations. So again, we get the same thing. We get the same like um, response from using quibble and triple. It's just a different way of writing out how you write it out to create that um, create that data. I think um, what was I gonna say? I think generally what the book was saying is it's kind of it's kind of more intuitive to have like um maybe use a triple because at least then if it's all in one row, you kind of know like everything's from a certain um, observation versus just knowing, yeah, you're knowing what's in each row of observation versus just knowing the numbers in the column. Yeah. And then, so in the summary, in this chapter, we learned how CSVs thought CSV files work and some of the problems we encounter with them and how to overcome them. And we'll come back to data import a few times in this book in chapter 21 from with regards to Excel and Google Sheets and chapter 22 with regards to loading data from databases, chapter 23, loading data from parquet files, chapter 24 was JSON and chapter 25 is websites. So this chapter did have some exercises, but I didn't do them because I also want to get through chapter nine, which is really, really short. And so with the last 15 minutes, I'm going to do that. Um, unless does anyone have any questions or if you had looked over the exercises, if you want to go into them more, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to switch over to chapter nine. Okay. Now, hopefully you all can see it. Okay, so chapter nine is workflow getting help. And the learning objectives are to describe a few tips beyond the book on how to get help and how, and to help you keep learning. Any idea what is from the input? Okay, we have a question from Jeremy. Any idea what read underscore CSV does when you input when the input has the same column names? That is interesting. Huh. I have no idea. Let me see. That would be interesting. So like if we I think it would be the best to try that. Let's see if we do this. And say we're going to have two columns called X. Oh, so it, I don't know if you can see it, it changed it to like X1 and X2, apparently. Yeah, does that answer your question, Jeremy? Okay, cool. Okay, so workflow getting help. So Google, um, if you get any error message and you have no idea what it means, chances are that someone has been confused by it in the past and there will be help somewhere on the web. So typically adding R to a Google query is enough to restrict it to relevant results. But if the search results aren't useful, 
try adding package names like Tediverse or GBplot2 to narrow down the results. So kind of like that's the difference between writing how to make a box plot in R versus how to make a box plot in R with ggplot2. And for example, if you're using R in like maybe Spanish or French and you get an error message that isn't in English, you can run the you can run this sys dot set, I guess that set environment language is equal to English and rerun the code as rerun the code as you're more likely to get help in for English error messages, like within your Google search. And if Google doesn't help, try spending a little time searching Stack Overflow for an existing answer by including the R to restrict your search to questions and answers that use R. And then there's a reprex. So if your Googling doesn't find anything useful, it's really a good idea to prepare a reprex for, for a minimal reproducible example. And a good reprex makes it easier for other people to help you. And often you'll find figure out the problem yourself in the course of making it. So there are two parts to creating a reprex, reprex making your code reproducible. So that's catching everything, including any library calls, and creating all necessary objects and making your code minimal. That's stripping away everything that is not directly related to your problem by creating a much smaller and simpler R object than the one you're facing in real life or even using built-in data. Wait, I just want to fix something in this really quick. It's bothering me. Okay. And um, Creating a repex may sound like a lot of work, but it has great payoffs. Um, for example, creating an excellent repex often reveals the source of your problem and may allow you to answer your own question. And you're, you'll capture the essence of your problem in a way that is easy for others to play with, which improves your chances of getting help. And the easiest way to avoid the mistake of accidentally missing, some, missing something when creating a repex by hand is by using the repex package. I'm going to open that up over here. I've actually never used this package, um, never made a reflex, I guess. But and I tried using I tried doing what's in the book, I think because I think because like my environment already had other things in it, it didn't work properly. But we can try it and see what it does. So yeah, so we get that, that the mean of y for the numbers one through four, the mean of them is 2.5, I guess adding these, but yeah. And then we're gonna call reprex, hopefully it works this time. Number reprex. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I think because we're making a book, it doesn't allow me to create a reprex. Maybe if I did it in a separate window, but yeah. But yeah, there's a package with the, the reprex package with the reprex function, and you can use it to create um, a nicely rendered HTML preview um, that will display in the viewer pane of our. It didn't work for me, but it should work for others. And then, yeah, but yeah, I'm not too familiar with it, so I'm not going to attempt to explain it, honestly. But yeah, um, so that's the reflex package. And I guess let me put that in the chat. Okay, and then let me see, making your reflexes reproducible. So there are three, three things you wanna include to make your example reproducible. The required packages, data, and code. And the packages should be loaded at the top of the script so it's easy to see which ones the example needs. And also you should check that you're using the latest versions of each package. And you may discover that a bug that's been fixed since you installed or last updated your packages and for, and for packages in the tidyverse, you can use the function tidyverse underscore update to check 
um, for updates. And then the easiest way to include data is to use the dput function to generate the R code needed to recreate it. Um, for example, to create the empty cars data set in R, perform the following steps where you'd run dput empty cars in R, copy the output, and in a reprex type empty cars, that, and then paste. So again, I did not try that, it, but hopefully it should work. And let me see if they show you. Yeah, actually they didn't show you it in the book either. Okay. Um, and then also spend a little bit of time ensuring that your code is easy for others to follow. So you want to make sure you use spaces and your variable names are concise yet informative. And then use comments to indicate where your problem lies. And also do your best to remove everything that is not related to the problem. Because the shorter your code is, the easier it is to understand and the easier it is to fix. And try to use the smallest subset of your data that still reveals the problem. And finish by checking that you've actually made a reproducible example by starting a fresh R session and copy and pasting your script. And then also investing in yourself. So it'll take some practice to learn to create a good, truly minimal reprex. Um, however, learning to ask questions that include the code and investing the time in making it reproducible will continue to pay off as you learn and master R. And also spend time preparing yourself to solve problems before they occur by investing a little time in learning R each day because it'll pay off handsomely in the long run. So one way is to follow what the Tidyverse team is doing by checking out the Tidyverse blog. I'll put that in the chat. Oops. Okay, did not. I'll have to do that later. It's just copying the word. <laughs> okay. And then to keep up with the R community more broadly, um, the authors recommend reading R Weekly, which is a community effort to aggregate the most interesting news in the R community each week. So, yeah. I'll just open those up. Yeah, so this is the Tidyverse blog. I'll put that in the chat. And then there's our weekly. Oh, pocket punk. Huh. The sections on pocket punk. Okay. But yeah, so that is all I have for this week. Um, unless are there any other any other questions about these chapters? If not, I'll stop my screen share. Uh, hello. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, about the reprex thing, like, have you tried putting in, like, the text of the code inside instead of just reprex, reprex, and no input? Oh, wait. So I've never done a reprex before. I don't know if you could show us what you mean, because I've never done one. Uh, okay. Uh, have you used it, or? Yeah, just that. I never used it in the book form before. Oh, but usually I just write quotes and let me try to open one out studio. Let me see how I can do this. And okay, I just open one new session and have a new file. And then if you want, you can screen share. I stopped my screen share. Uh, okay, uh, let me see like this. 
So, yeah, I think like, usually people will put like this and mm -hmm. then they will, you mean if it's a one line code, we'll just put it as one line first and mm -hmm. then it will appear. And oh. if it's like many lines, okay, like this, that people, it, I'm not sure if, uh, I usually what I'll do is I'll like highlight it and go to the add in and add reflex selection and oh. then like this uh, of course uh, I will read maybe I just put this I'm not sure if this will work and That. And usually it's already copied. Oh. So if you go to Notepad, uh, you can just paste it immediately and it gets these nice markdowns. So what happens oh, is that's yeah, that's so that's it's cool. useful when you go to like GitHub, uh, when you want to post an issue, you can mm. just paste it. Uh, maybe I'll just go to my own repository and open an issue. Mm. Even my previous project, I have an issue and then new issue. And then if I paste the same thing, we look at the preview, it comes out like mm. this, how people mix it like that. And I think it also works, not sure if it works in the block too. Uh, I'm not sure how to see the preview uh, oh. of the code as well. Maybe yeah, I better don't put it here. <laughs> I mean, you could put it, you probably put it in book club. You can put it in our book club, see what it looks like. Okay, uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> this, I'm not sure how to put the preview on this. Uh, let's yeah. see. No, it doesn't really work. Oh, is it because I'm, I'm not in a code form? Because I know yeah. like book clubs, it needs to be in a code form or something like that. But I'm not sure how what to turn it to Code. Was it this what button it here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Code block. Yeah, yeah. Was it code block? Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, I think, I think, I think we need to. It's not really but I think that that should be the oh. code block instead, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah. That is but very I think cool. GitHub, it it looks like this if you type it like yeah. that. But I think the the function that refresh refresh. I think it takes the whole file. I think. Like uh, because I have to have the oh flyer. that's why it wouldn't work because <laughs> I was like in the whole file. It was trying to read the yeah, whole file kind of. Yeah. Oh. And because I know like the info is usually like a text. Uh, yeah. Let's try again. The text. Yeah, it's just then it has this kind of error. This thing I don't read. But usually this is what I, I do because we should quotes are short and usually I just render the selection and then it's easier. Does it already come with those add-ins? I've never tried that. That's oh, and when you type a library oh. reprex, right, then the usually that has add-in. So yes, I had a package down add-in and these are all add-ins. Wow. I never knew that. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, cool. Cool. And that yeah, but if I try that the add in a render reflex, like I guess like they'll tell you what the source is, maybe in a much clearer form, like maybe it's the current yeah. file and maybe in default is GitHub and maybe you try select messages this time. I'm not very sure. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> really like render mm. <laughs> see if it goes. Yeah. It, it, it seems to yeah, it seems to be the same thing. So maybe I okay. just paste it and maybe yeah, it looks like it is suitable for Slack now. Let's try yeah. it out. <laughs> maybe uh how do you open a new message in here? <laughs> yeah. Try it out this time and yeah. if you send that one, then just start creating no. <laughs> yeah. no, oh. still need some work in Slack. Uh yeah. It looks so very cool. So now if I have problems, I can make a refresh and put them in slides. That I is mean, very good. Yeah, but, but 
Yeah, I mean, this is how I do it. I'm not so sure how to do it for the function level. How do I stop yeah. sharing? Mm. Okay. Well, that was very cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to tell, yeah, I'm going to ask John to 